Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And joining us today is our colleague Julian Sanchez. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Julian. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk today about digital privacy from less of a policy standpoint and more of a technological standpoint. So to do that, maybe we'll start with the question, when we're online going about our regular day of browsing the internet and watching Netflix and shopping and doing whatever else we do, what kind of data are we creating and having recorded places that we might not necessarily think about? Sure. Uh, well, let me answer that in a kind of broad 30,000 feet way and then, and then in a more specific way. Uh, in a broad sense, if you assume that essentially every imaginable piece of data uh, about what you're doing online is being recorded somewhere, um, you will more often than not be right at least for some segment of the sites you're looking at and it's probably uh, being tracked by more entities uh, than, than you would guess. Um, and that's because uh, in part, sort of the business model of the internet has become surveillance. Uh, we use all these free services that um, operate on the premise that they're going to be able to uh, make their revenue not from payments from their users but uh, by selling uh, ads or information that can be used to profile uh, and track people. Uh, and also in part because uh, the default in a sense has changed, right? For most of human history, uh, tracking and recording details about any event uh, was an extra step that had to be taken. It was abnormal. Um, almost everything you did uh, left no permanent, structured, centralized record. Uh, of what you were doing, your conversations, what you were reading uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you talk about uh, online activity, well, it's already happening on a data manipulation device. So you're already sort of halfway there. Um, and additionally, data storage costs have plummeted. Uh, I mean, so right when I was a kid in the early uh, 1980s, the amount of data that sort of uh, is by default uh, on my iPhone's hard drive would have cost you about the same as a pretty nice car. Um, so we've sort of hit the point where storing is in a sense as cheap as throwing away. That in some cases, throwing data away is cheaper than, than keeping it even if you uh, don't know yet what you want to do with it. Keeping it is cheaper than throwing it away. Right. So yeah, there's essentially an incentive to, to, to stockpile this stuff on the theory um, that even if you don't have a use for it now, you might have a use for it. Uh, at some point in the future, uh, and indeed because computer processing power has grown, um, it's increasingly useful to have all sorts of information that uh, before just would have been clutter that you couldn't have done anything with. So that's the, is it, the general answer. Is it, it such that that Google has all this information on me? Is it granular to the point that that if someone really wanted to figure out Trevor Burris and what he likes, that you could actually do that? Absolutely. If you were an employee at Google and you had access to all the things that they have? I mean, and they're, they're pretty stringent, uh, at least one hopes they are. Uh, they, they say they are about controlling who has access to that kind of stuff directly. Uh, most of this is about automated systems that are uh, deciding what kind of ads you get. Um, but I think in principle, that's absolutely the case. And I'll, I'll talk about specifics in a second. Um, this is probably the, sort of the, the point of full disclosure to note that uh, I think Google and some of the other technology companies we're, we're going to be talking about either have been or are uh, donors in some amount to Cato. I try not to keep too much track of, uh, of that precisely because these are companies I sometimes write about. But um, if that's something you find relevant, uh, take, take that with as much salt as, um, as you think appropriate. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think uh, these companies often have an incredibly intimate uh, picture of us. Facebook, I know, um, uh, has sort of running experiments just to see what they they could deduce. Um, found that very often, just from someone's social graph, they could tell um, uh, someone's sexual orientation, regardless of whether they'd uh, actually identified themselves as gay or straight, uh, based on uh, patterns of who their friends were, unsurprisingly. If you're gay, you probably have a, a, a lot more gay friends than uh, most straight people. Uh, and also by looking at frequency of communication or the frequency with which people looked at other people's pages, they could predict when someone was going to break up or get divorced and predict uh, who then they were going to start a new relationship with, uh, often before any of that was public and probably in some cases before the, uh, the folks themselves were, were conscious of it. Um, 
There was a, a notorious case that was reported in the New York Times a couple of years back uh, in which uh, a – and this isn't really about online activity. This is about data mining more generally in which a, um, a father has angrily complained to Target that they had started sending his teenage daughter – uh, marketing materials for maternity clothes and baby formula, uh, and said, "Look, she's you know this girl's 15 years old. Why would why would she need this stuff?" Uh, well, it turned out she was in fact pregnant, uh, and that uh, the company had gotten very good at detecting purchase patterns that uh, might not be intuitive uh, to someone who hasn't looked at huge amounts of aggregate data, but it turned out to, uh, in tandem, very strongly predict pregnancy. Uh, things, again, that might not be obvious, like um, someone has switched from scented to unscented hand lotion. That's very common when someone knows they're pregnant. Uh, a series of other changes in purchases uh, that, again, might not be obvious, but if you have a huge data set and, you know, like Target, you actually have people who then register for baby showers. Um, give you the ability to look back and say, okay, uh, you know, having this crunched not by a human brain but by uh, high-powered computers, can we find patterns that with some reasonably high degree of accuracy correlate with this person is about to be pregnant or about to publicize uh, that they're pregnant? And if you think about um, certainly a company like Google, uh, I mean, I uh, – Again, sometimes I, I joke that if, if you lived in a country where the government had the kind of detailed information about you that Google does, um, you would surely think that was a police state. Um, now, again, we hope this is information they're using for our benefit and to give, provide us useful services, uh, 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 not to oppress us, but it is uh, uh, a, little, a little sobering to recognize that in addition to probably you know, the contents of – uh, of messages you're sending. That's the obvious stuff. Um, they just have an incredible amount of information about what you're thinking about day to day in a way that's almost a, a map of your brain, right? What medical conditions are you searching for? What political topics uh, are, uh, are you curious about? What YouTube videos are you watching? Um, but also, uh, you know, maybe much more granular information. So we, we think about um, when we visit a web page, of course, if we're at all technically sophisticated, we realize that, of course, um, probably that website has some way of tracking, uh, you know, that at least a person from a particular internet uh, protocol address visited their page and they may have, if you've logged in, they may have more uh, granular information than that about who exactly you are. Um, but beyond that, uh, a lot of sites are tracking in much more detail what you're doing on a page. Um, how far did you scroll? Did you scroll down uh, just sort of all the way through quickly? Or are you scrolling sort of slowly and continuously at the speed of someone reading normally? Are you moving your mouse around the page and highlighting certain things um, in a way that suggests you might have copied that, uh, that part of the page? Um, this is you know, because of JavaScript. It's, it's possible to, in a very precise way, look at these uh, – indicators of human behavior just within a web page, it, it, it ways we're interacting with a page that we don't even think about as being a transmission of, of data, but, but ultimately are. Well, that's like just as an interesting application of that kind of stuff is so Google, we're all familiar with the type in the words that you see in this photograph right. um, to decide to hide spam bots and right. make sure you're a person. And Google fairly recently rolled out a new version of it where you just it's just a checkbox and you click it. And I was it decides, wondering about this. It must and, have something data and on it's, your computer. It's, a, it's exactly that same like mouse movement and other patterns. Yes. It knows that robots move in certain ways and humans right. move in other ways, and so it can tell. Right. So it's one sort of, of like the replicant test. Right. One one of the one of the uh, I mean, so one of the obvious uses of this is tracking engagement. So uh, uh, a news site might want to be able to talk to advertisers about how much time people really spend on the page. Does it look like they're actually reading it, um, but also, right, telling the difference between an automated scraper or some kind of bot that may be uh, you know, either ripping the content off your site or uh, uh, just probing your system for, for hacks versus an actual human being engaging in a normal way with the site um, for security purposes may be extremely useful. And increasingly, um, some of the most sophisticated sites are, are doing exactly that, are tracking uh, to tell the difference between uh, a human who's actually reading the page and interacting with it the way a human would and uh, an automated system that, of course, is not reading the page because it's just sort of scanning everything quickly. Um, so that that kind of information can uh, can provide pretty granular data. In principle, you might imagine being able to use that for more specific kinds of fingerprinting. Um, 
uh, and uh, oftentimes data about uh, what pages you're looking at and how that might connect to other pages you're looking at is uh, not just something that can be seen by uh, the page you're visiting. So um, uh, if you load up a page uh, on, the, on the web, uh, very often you'll see maybe a flash video or a flash ad or other kinds of images uh, that are advertisements for different sites. Uh, well, usually those ads are not loading up from the site you're visiting. Um, they're loading up from some third-party site. Um, so essentially, there's, you know, imagine that square uh, of space on the web page uh, is essentially saying, pull in content from somewhere else on the internet, and that's what's displaying. But because your computer is then connecting to that somewhere else uh, that the... the uh, the ad is loading up for, that that other site may have the ability uh, to track your activity across a series of different pages. So even if you're not logged into a site, um, it may be that because you're connecting to a series of different sites um, that the advertisers are still able to profile you and connect um, your activity on one part of the internet with what you're doing on a different part of the internet. Um, uh, you know, perhaps that is in fact tied to your uh, real identity. So that means that even if you think you're you're operating anonymously, look, I just uh, you know loaded up this page on the New York Times. I didn't log in or anything. I didn't give them any information. Um, if you have not taken steps to counter this, it's very likely that um, any number of uh, advertising networks and uh, 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 data brokers are still able to add that particular web page visit to the bigger profile they have about you. So this sounds creepy. Partly that's because the the use of this stuff is advertising and commerce is kind of turning us into money for the various outlets. But it also sounds profoundly useful. Like if I had, you know, let's say I had access to the data that Google is gathering on me, I could imagine this, you know, you Google could tell me I you may be coming down with you know, you, you don't know it, but you've been showing symptoms of this thing going wrong, or your mental state is this depression, or, suicide, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, is there is all of this stuff being kept just for advertisers, or are we moving in a direction where we could we could personally gain more use out of this kind of big data mining about ourselves as individuals? Sure. I mean, there, there's an entire movement called the it's called the quantified self uh, movement that is precisely about people who. Uh, enjoy what what's sometimes called life logging or really granular measurement of one's own activity, and there are. Um, it's like know, I mean, there are your steps, I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, look, like we, know, level, we 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 right? we uh, strap on Fitbits or other kinds of uh, you know, biometric devices that uh, will tell us right how how much we walk today, how many calories we might have burned. Um, you know, it may be awkward if, if you're wearing it during, you know, intercourse, for example, and that shows up as a strange <laughs> spike in your There was just a murderer life caught. But there, for uh, just, just by, uh, by Just a Fitbit. Fitbit. Like his – he claimed his wife – there was information found on his dead wife's Fitbit that contradicted his story about her location or activities and was the thing that broke it for them charging him with murder. And I imagine that that's the kind of thing we're going to see happening – uh, you know, with, with increasing frequency just because the ubiquity of uh, network sensing devices is, is growing at a, a very rapid rate. And there are, you know, benefits to this both personal and social. At the, um, at the you know, at the personal level, it may be very useful to, to learn facts about uh, when you tend to overeat uh, or uh, whether in fact you're getting enough calories on the, on the flip side uh, or what are the conditions under which you actually uh, exercise as much as you want to or uh, or just how are you spending your time? I mean, you know, the first thing you read in a lot of sort of management books, uh, you know, the sort of habits of effective people type of book um, is nobody is actually accurate just relying on their own memory about how they spend the time in their day. And so it can be very useful to realize, gosh, yeah, when I think I'm uh, taking a uh, a five-minute break to check email or look at the news, I'm actually losing half an hour. Um, that can all be useful. Personally, it can be useful socially, uh, tracking um, appliance usage through uh, smart appliances, the Internet of Things, um, can enable more efficient, greener uh, energy use uh, so that we don't need to uh, you know, burn as much fossil fuel or, or generate as much energy to, to supply our needs. Uh, uh, medical 
professional medical researchers find enormously useful, uh, big data analysis that can help them look for uh, patterns of either interactions with medical conditions or uh, 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 trends in disease propagation. Um, so, I mean, the reason this is all being done is that it is uh, – profitable to someone, which is at least a benefit to them, and often beneficial more generally, either socially or to individuals. Um, you know, I mean, to take the sort of the banal case, yeah, uh, Amazon obviously benefits when they can sell me products because they know my my reading and, and music listening uh, and viewing habits. But it's also useful to me that, uh, you know, I get an email that actually is used is not just, uh, you know, a random list of bestsellers, but there are books coming out by these authors who um, either you like or you are likely to like because you like these other things. Um, that's handy. I've certainly bought uh, books or music uh, on that basis that I, where I might not otherwise have been aware. Um, so yeah, there is utility to all this, um, and I think that's part of the reason we we accept it. Um, the, the the reason to be just cautious though is just that there is nothing intrinsic to how this operates precisely because so much of the data gathering is invisible. Um, there's nothing that guarantees that it's being used for your benefit. Um, and when I say it's invisible, I mean you can find out. Um, there's a there's a, a a plugin. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of privacy defense technology. But there's a a, pri a a plugin called Ghostery that helps. Uh, block uh, the gathering of, of information by uh, third-party websites. Um, and one of the things Ghostory can do is when you load a web page, it can um, tell you all the different entities that have trackers on that page uh, that are monitoring uh, in some way, at least, your activity, if, if, if only the fact that you loaded that page. Um, and you will see that those names popping up again and again. Uh, and you should you know, take that as a sign that that is an entity then that um, – is very likely to be able to correlate the fact that you visited uh, any page that has that uh, that company's tracker on it. Um, That's for for any Trump supporters out there. Um, if you want something legit to be mad at the mainstream media about, it's the megabytes and megabytes of trackers that they're chewing up your data plan with whenever you visit the NewYorkTimes.com or other major newspapers. It's astonishing how many there are if you install something that tells you. Although, I mean, almost everyone does that. I mean, that, that is, that is uh, borderline ubiquitous. I mean, even in, in you think about email, um, and I think Cato may do this. Um, so sorry to our marketing people. But, um, you know, very often when you get a marketing email, it will contain a little invisible image called a tracking pixel, um, which essentially works the same way as uh, uh, ads on uh, websites you visit. That is, it is loading that image from a third-party site from – some either Cato itself or some marketing uh, company's site that is uh, linked to a unique identifier. Um, so essentially, it's a way of saying, we know this person opened this email at this time, um, which then is helpful because you can have a unique uh, ID associated with a link in the email. So you know, um, did they open this? And then if they opened it, did they act? How many people just deleted it without reading it? Um, you can shut this off. Most Email clients have an option somewhere to disable, uh, usually says load remote images. Um, this is one of these things that you may have seen in your settings, but if you don't know why it's there, um, it might just you might just think that this is something that's to save time loading stuff. It's actually a, a privacy feature. Um, it's usually not marked that way. So uh, even if you've noticed this in your settings, if this isn't something you are pretty focused on, you might not have realized that that's not just a data yeah, you know, a download saving feature, but a privacy feature. I want to ask about uh, some things that are not. Well, they're still the internet. Everything, everything is the internet now. It seems the Internet of Things. But uh, you ask about the Juicero juice maker. Of course, the Juicero oh. that needs to know that your uh, Wi-Fi. What is it? Wi-Fi. It's the connected. juice maker that only works if you're connected to Wi-Fi. Yes, of course. But uh, no, I want to ask about Alexa and your smart TV and all yeah. this sort of idea that that. Alexa is always listening or your TV is always listening and more things are going to be listening to us as, the, as it goes on. Is, is this something that they're also recording? I mean, is it listening to the point – do we think that they're listening to the point that they have our entire conversation somewhere that we have in my living room, somewhere in a – on a database at Google headquarters or is it just listening for its name? Right. So in theory, 
Uh, and if you are technically inclined, I suppose you could run uh, Wireshark on your local network and, and look at the patterns of traffic between the um, Wire Wireshark. Just a I don't know what that is. It's a it's a device. It's a a nerdy thing that ninety nine percent of the people listening to this will not um, be equipped to use. So it doesn't <laughs> matter. Um, it is a, a piece of software that can uh, scrutinize network traffic um, pretty grandly. So if you wanted to see um, what all the devices on your Wi-Fi network are doing, how often they're transmitting data and where they're sending it, um, it can be used for security. People often use it for, for sort of diagnostic purposes. Um, but uh, so in theory, my understanding is that, that um, a device like the Amazon Echo Alexa is um, – mostly just listening for its name, and then when it hears its name is transmitting that information back to Amazon. Um, but you sort of have to trust, if you, if you don't know how to use something like Wireshark well, um, you sort of have to trust that that's in fact how it's working. Um, I know there is a, a relatively recent case where uh, Amazon was, was basically fighting with the federal government over an attempt to obtain uh, their logs of someone's uh, Alexa traffic uh, for uh, use in a murder investigation. Well, that could help with the timeline. It was like I wasn't in the right. house. It's like right. well, that, can, you that can be Alexa useful for, for a, a number yeah. of reasons, including right is is this alibi plausible? Was he in fact uh, in town when he said he was out of town? Um, Right? Did he? Did, 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 yeah. Did he say Alexa purchase uh, <laughs> the killing knife wrench yeah. and uh, yeah. Uh, that, that, no, that's, it's interesting, but that brings us to the, the kind of – I apologize, by the way, for everyone who's listening to this out loud in their living room and um, – and You just turned on Alexa. Just yes. had their Amazon device. Fair, we can do it. Hey, Siri and OK, Google. Yeah. So it could say Alexa, order a sharp knife and maybe that just happened. But but anyway, so for the government, we brought up what the government might be, be doing with some of these things, which of course, that's the interesting question here is some people are very uh, – Concern with corporations too. I think that's less true. That's somewhat less true of libertarians. But we we might want to be concerned about what corporations are doing with with our data. But then we have the government, and if they want this or try to get it for various reasons, they could do a lot of stuff to us. As you said, it's almost like a totalitarian state. What how much data they have on us? Uh, is that something that concerns you? Or – which I actually know that of course it is. But is it something that's happening? Absolutely. Uh, I mean I always – you know, people always say, well, aren't you more worried about all these companies that have these vast reams of data about us? I usually say, well, Google's never tried to, uh, you know, blackmail Martin Luther King into su uh, committing suicide. Um, so just in terms of the track record. Um, and, you know, more generally, yeah, uh, companies that are gathering this data because they want to make money um, and – this is not, you know, true in a blanket way, but by and large, the sort of the most pernicious thing they're they're doing with that is trying to sell us stuff. Um, whereas, if we look at the history of uh, government intelligence agencies, uh, we see much more pernicious uh, types of surveillance. Um, you know, surveillance of uh, political activists and civil rights leaders for purposes of harassment. Um, surveillance for the purpose of of political. Uh, manipulation, manipulation, public opinion manipulation. Um, so I, I think there are sort of democratic reasons to be more concerned about that kind of surveillance just in terms of motives and also, of course, in terms of the kind of power they're able to exercise, which is that just Google can't really throw you in jail. Um, that said, current legal doctrines are such that uh, for a lot of types of data, if a company like Google or Amazon has it, or uh, the government has pretty easy access to it. Um, under a, a what's known as the third party doctrine, which was sort of established in the in the late 1970s before um, sort of the internet or uh, mass data mining was a thing, uh, the, the idea is that with probably the exception of the contents of your interpersonal communications, that is to say, except exempting uh, the contents of a voice call or a, a video chat or a uh, uh, you know maybe an email exchange, the data these companies have about you and your activities that's just part of their business records 
is not something you have a Fourth Amendment interest in. So it can be obtained by voluntary disclosure or by a simple subpoena. Uh, and this is the reason, of course, that the the uh, the NSA's uh, sort of infamous bulk telephone records collection program uh, was seen as uh, by the by the secret FISA court as not a violation of the Fourth Amendment because again, according to this doctrine, um, the information of the type that is kept in your phone bill or in the call detail records maintained by the phone company is not information you have any Fourth Amendment interest in. And so it doesn't require any kind of particularized search warrant. And so uh, there was no constitutional obstacle, the courts had held, to saying, well, then fine, we want everyone's, um, every American's call history uh, to be stored for five years for, uh, for future analysis. Um, that's, that's not a Fourth Amendment search as far as that legal doctrine is concerned. So um, even if you're not especially concerned about corporate uses of it, um, it is worth noting the sort of symbiotic relationship between these companies and, and the surveillance state. Uh, one of the early Snowden revelations of uh, uh, how Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act uh, was being used uh, involved a program called PRISM, which was specifically about the uh, partnership of the government with major uh, technology platforms, uh, uh, communications platforms, and technology companies. So uh, basically, all the the big ones were, were in there. So you had you know Facebook and Google and Yahoo and uh, Microsoft, uh, AOL I think was there. Um, uh, because they they understand that, that there is this this very useful symbiosis where. Companies are gathering very large amounts of data for their own business purposes because it either makes them a profit or helps them serve their users better or uh, helps them uh, secure their own services. And as in the case we discussed earlier where you might want to profile someone's activity to tell it's a human being and not some kind of bot that might be used by a, a, a scraper or a hacker. Um, and then uh, because they've gathered these massive amounts of data, under current legal doctrines, the government has access to it subject to a much lower standard of scrutiny. Um, and the, the real rate limiting factor there tends to be the extent to which um, the companies are willing and able to fight back. Um, sometimes, especially when uh, it is semi-public what's going on, they will be uh, more vigorous in trying to uh, 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 resist uh, overbroad requests for information. Um, when it's entirely secret, though, uh, the incentives are a little bit different. Uh, the question is, are you as a, a, a company with a sort of fiduciary responsibility to shareholders going to spend time and money on very expensive lawyers to challenge a government request in front of a secret court um, that is probably not going to uh, uh, be that amenable to your, your challenge and – which you don't get to claim any credit for later. You don't get to say, you see, the other companies, they just gave up all this information, but we fought back. Uh, shouldn't you be uh, you know, happy about that and give us your patronage? Um, because it's all secret. Uh, it's, it's something that you are willing to do only in a sense out of, out of pure public spiritedness, um, which is not how a lot of companies work. So government can be a threat in the sense that if the if private companies are gathering this data, it's accessible in some way to the government should they want it. Um, can government also help? You see, so you hear a lot of calls for we should pass laws that would limit the amount of data that companies can collect about us, or limit how long they can store it, or require data collection to be opt in instead of opt out. Mm -hmm. Do you think that those kinds of laws would be valuable, or those kinds of regulations? Uh, so. I will say I'm I'm a bit of two minds on this. Um, I, I will say I think it is it is a little bit troubling from sort of a libertarian perspective how much data is being collected about people that that really they don't uh, recognize is being gathered uh, or how it's being used. Right? We may give one site some information sort of on the premise it's it's being shared internally for. Uh, some reason that that is useful to our reason for uh, for going to that site or for using that service, um, and usually somewhere on page twelve of the thirty page uh, highly legalistic terms of service that every single site or service you visit is going to have. Um, there's something describing their ability to share more broadly than that. Um, 
you know, very often our, our computers are transmitting data, again, that we're not even aware is being sent. So, you know, you visit uh, a site, again, by default, your computer is sending some information about the configuration of your browser. What operating system are you using? What browser are you using? What plugins do you have available? Um, which very often, at least in combination with an, e uh, an IP address, giving you rough location, is going to be enough to more or less identify you uh, by fingerprinting that particular configuration in that particular place. Um, and so, you know, I I'm not automatically and in principle uh, averse to the idea that uh, th there, it might be appropriate to say, look, we should ensure that when people are sort of turning over this information, they're doing so genuinely consensually and not because um, – you know, just normal people are not sufficiently technically sophisticated to understand what they're transmitting uh, to, to these companies. On the other hand, I, I am reluctant to uh, to endorse what would be likely to come out of any actual political process, I think, um, for a bunch of reasons. One is just um, there are different cases that you have different intuitions about, I think, in terms of what kinds of information is useful for uh, a site to collect and store. Uh, I think a lot of these sites would rightly say that just as, uh, you know, in, in a sense, people might have less meaningful knowledge and consent of what they're uh, agreeing to uh, because no one can wade through all these legalistic privacy agreements. At the same time, if you make someone opt into every single sort of benign use of information that you might make of, uh, of their data, that that equally is going to... Uh, Add so much friction that uh, you you end up uh, uh, foreclosing good and benign uses of information, and I think maybe the the most significant issue here is that uh, I think you're likely to end up uh, with a scenario where a lot of functions just move offshore. Um, so you just end up with a lot of advertisers um, operating in parts of the world that aren't subject to U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, or uh, traffic being driven to sites that are operating outside U.S. jurisdiction, and it's not really clear how you, um, Deal yeah, how you mitigate that without sort of balkanizing the internet and saying, well, you can't link now to uh, to sites uh, outside the U.S. or you can't have advertisements from companies outside the U.S. Um, it's, it's, it's it's a thorny problem. I mean, I I think uh, I I don't give the kind of automatic uh, you know, rejection of uh, uh, of that notion. I think there there is um, some kind of case to be made for it, just on on grounds of of the idea that people should meaningfully consent um, to disclosure of information about themselves. Um, but it is difficult to see as a, as sort of a practical matter um, how you achieve that without a lot of other baggage um, and without. To trivial circumvention. Then if private companies are going to continue to collect this data because it's valuable to them and often central to their business model, and we're skeptical of getting the government involved in protecting our privacy online, we turn to other steps that we as individuals can take to protect ourselves. So you mentioned Ghostry, which is an ad blocker, and Ad blockers have gotten more popular, and now there's rumors that Google's going to bake one into one of the upcoming versions of their Chrome desktop browser. Are are ad blockers a good way to protect ourselves? Yeah, I think that, that one one uh, step in a sort of suite of uh, things you might want to be doing uh, to protect your online privacy uh, is have something like Ghostery or. No script or a range of other privacy protecting plugins that are uh, baked into your browser. Uh, you know, I, I, privacy or anonymity online is a sort of sub subset of s security more broadly construed. Um, they often tend to, to go together and complement each other. Um, and how much is sort of appropriate to you is going to be a, a sort of relative question. Um, if you want to ask whether a particular location is secure. You need to know, is it is it Fort Knox or is it your private home? Um, the level of security that's more than adequate for a private home is going to be wildly inadequate for, for Fort Knox um, because the question is, what are you defending against? 
Um, so if it's a question of I don't want to be casually tracked by uh, advertisers or companies, then yeah, that may be uh, the sort of a, the primary thing you want to do. Um, in terms of your online privacy or anonymity more broadly, you might have different needs if you are you know, a journalist or an activist uh, or an academic who's communicating with people in um, parts of the world with uh, more repressive governments. Um, so step one, though, certainly, would might, might be to do something like that. Uh, use the ad blocker. Right. Um, now, what about something like passwords? Right. Like, should you be using really long passwords or well, so different it, passwords for everything? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's worth noting that because we're a you know public policy think tank, we're talking about government surveillance and NSA. But at least in in the short term, uh, in terms of a practical impact on on ordinary people who aren't activists or academics or journalists, uh, it is likely that the the most realistic near-term privacy threat is some kind of criminal hacker uh, stealing your information, uh, uh, leaking stuff online. Um, we've seen, of course, ex plenty of high-profile examples of this happening in the last few years, ranging from celebrities having their photos leaked to companies having their internal documents published. Um, and yeah, in terms of the uh, the way that happens, we hear a lot of focus from security folks on what are called zero-day exploits, meaning some new vulnerability in a particular piece of software that has never before been disclosed and so hasn't been patched. But the truth is most breaches are not the result of some zero-day exploit. Much more common is either uh, old vulnerabilities that just have been patched but the system hasn't been updated. So. Um, someone just hasn't bothered to go to the newest version of the software that is secured against publicly known security holes. Uh, but also just password phishing or password guessing. People use weak, bad passwords and they use the same password across multiple sites. Um, the easiest way to um, avoid this is just use a password manager, something like uh, 1Password. There's a whole range of these. Um, I use 1Password, but there's uh, a whole a whole array, um, most of which are pretty good. Um, and what, now, do the, what do those do? The idea there is that they will generate very strong and uh, long passwords of the kind a human being might have trouble memorizing uh, and uh, store them all and automatically fill them in. So you have a little app either on your phone or on your, uh, your desktop that plugs into your web browser and ensures that you've got a strong, hard-to-crack, uh, unique password for every site so that you're not compromised across all the sites you use if one of them is breached um, and and that it's you know the kind of password you might not want to try and memorize uh, now the downside to this is of course if the um, if the master password file itself is cracked and usually those are stored encrypted and so you need to memorize at least one strong password which is the one you're using to encrypt all those. Well, two, I guess, because also the one you're using to uh, encrypt your, the device itself. Uh, but uh, so you do have a sort of central store there. But there are not a lot of practical cases where that is breached, um, where even without a password manager, you, you're not already essentially done. Um, so for example, someone might have a keylogger installed on your computer. So they're able to see uh, when you unlock your uh, your password manager and decrypt that file, and then they are able to steal the file. But of course, under those conditions, if you don't have a password manager, they're still able to see uh, what you're typing and steal all your passwords. So, uh, on the whole, I think those are a great um, uh, a great tool, to, and it's probably the most simple, practical thing you can do to make yourself more secure. Not necessarily just about government, but in general against attackers of any stripe. Um, I will say, if you don't want to use one of those. Uh, it's not that hard to, to have better passwords. Um, one thing you can do is use a phrase instead of just a word. I mean, most sites now will let you take a pick a, a pretty long password. So um, some weird string of six or seven or eight characters with all sorts of special characters um, is probably not as strong as just a string of five English words in a row. Um, if you want to, uh, if you if you can't do that if it won't let you use a, something that long. Uh, you, know, you can create 
mnemonics to make things more memorable. So uh, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, uh, the lamb was sure to go. Um, the first letter of every word there is, I think, 22 characters, and you maybe throw in a couple digits at the end. Um, you've got something that's pretty, I wouldn't use that one because I just used that specific example on a, uh, a podcast we're talking about security <laughs> Everyone's going to have the same password, Julian. Look what you did. But you can pick a very memorable phrase and then use the first letter or the last letter of each word to create a string that is sort of gibberish um, and very long, but that you're not going to forget anytime soon. Um, and it would even be safe to write down, um, right? People make fun of, oh, the, the idiot who wrote his password on a Post-it. Um, and yeah, you know, if you write down Bank of America, then the, the exact password, that's not a great idea. Although, I mean, in general, physical spaces are, um, you know, providing you a fair amount of security, right? If you've got a very secure password and the the attack surface is someone has physical access to the location where it's stored, um, maybe you might have other problems. It's not a, it's not a great idea if it's your if it's your office, but um, where lots of people have access. But um, if it's your home or your wallet. Um, and you can write it down in a, in a more obscured way. So I might write down, uh, you know, river to remind me bank and then Mary to remind me the first letter of or the lamb. You've got a way to write it down so that you remember what's associated with each site without actually having to uh, write it down in such a way that it would be useful to an attacker if it was stolen. What about something like using your fingerprint for your phone? Because we had this with San Bernardino. Uh, the question of can the government force you to put your fingerprint on her phone and we have some searching at the TSA saying you're going to search phone. Should, should you be using a fingerprint or should you be using a passcode? Does it right. really matter? So the first thing to say is uh, for the way in practice most people use devices, you, the, uh, the, de the that device, your smartphone, is sort of the master key to everything else uh, unless you are – very, very willing to do a lot of stuff manually that, that most people are not. It probably has stored credentials to all your other sites. So someone has access to your phone. They have access to essentially every other secure site you're, uh, you're using and probably all your email. And frankly, if they've got access to your email, they've got access to everything else because just about every site has some sort of password reset function, um, which means you can reset the password by having it send you an email. Um, and even if they have two-factor authentication, the most popular form of two-factor authentication, meaning they're using a password plus something else, so guessing your password isn't enough, um, is a text to that phone. Um, so the sort of single biggest security hole in, in most people's life is their phone. So that should certainly have a very strong, uh, strong passcode. Don't, don't keep it un, unpasscoded, certainly. Um, and certainly, I mean, don't even use a four or five or six digit. Um, you can only use six code. for an iPhone, though. That's the you can, No, you can, you can change it to a uh, – you have to go into the settings oh, really? to okay. say, I want a long, a long form – passcode, but it's absolutely worth doing. The fingerprint, I think, is one of these trade-off things. Now, if, you're, if your threat model is primarily the police or the government, one trade-off here is that... So if you're a drug dealer or something like right. that. So, um, so, so all the drug dealers I know, listening... I know, I know. Uh, this is a very popular it. podcast with, <laughs> with narcotics traffickers, but uh, if your threat model is primarily the government, um, a lot of courts are holding that under the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination... Uh, you cannot be compelled to cough up or enter your passcode or password, but you can be compelled because it's not testimony to give them a fingerprint. And I think legally that's that's uh, very plausibly the right answer. Um, but it does mean that if that's your your threat model, um, that that may uh, create a problem. Now this is mitigated to some extent, even in that scenario, because one you only have so many tries of the fingerprint on the on the phone uh, before it requires the full passcode. It requires the full passcode if the phone has been powered down or if it hasn't been unlocked in uh, I think forty eight hours. So, uh, in, in a lot of scenarios, uh, even if it has the fingerprint uh, unlock capability, uh, by the time someone is actually legally compelling you to do so, uh, it's not relevant because the passcode is uh, is at that point. Um, still required anyway. You can mitigate that by choosing a non-standard finger. Um, so uh, I won't say which one I use, but <laughs> most people use their thumb. If you pick a different one, um, it might be a little less accurate, but it also means if someone's pushing your thumb on 
uh, on the thing, uh, whether the government or a, or a mugger, in an attempt to get it unlocked. Because um, you couldn't be compelled to tell them which finger you used. Presumably not. You say, uh, look, it's not working, man. I, I don't think the courts have tested that one, but um, but and you know, frankly, look, these things are not perfect. So, you know, would someone know whether it was just well, you were sweaty and it didn't quite read it right, or um, oh, whoops, I was really using my pinky. Um, that said, I think on the whole, uh, for most people, the fingerprint reader is a security benefit uh, because it makes it practical to use a long, strong passcode if you only are going to have to enter it when you reboot your phone, which most people don't do on a daily basis, as opposed to every time you want to use the phone. Um, if, you want, if you need to you know, punch in something every time you're using your phone, it's, most people are just not going to in any practical way um, use some 25-character uh, complicated uh, thing. Um, and even for you know, these other security solutions like those uh, uh, visual patterns you sometimes see on Android phones where it's, you basically draw a little picture. Um, in theory, the number of different possible combinations is huge. In practice, almost everyone uses a much, much narrower range of, uh, of the possible things you might draw. Uh, a lot of people just use the essentially the shape of their first initial. Uh, so that may not be as secure as you think. Um, and also there are other sort of attacks on uh, a passcode that's being frequently entered. So, uh, you know, if you have to enter this on a device that you're using in public all the time, the odds grow, right, that either through just a person looking over your shoulder or a camera that, use, you know, applying some kind of sophisticated software analytics is able to tell from sort of minute movements of your fingers or one of the, the what waiters you're typing at, in. One of the waiters at Mar-a-Lago. Or, yes, or one of the waiters <laughs> at Mar-a-Lago um, is, is going to be able to derive that passcode. Um, so in terms of sort of practical scenarios, there are a lot of ways your fingerprint can be obtained. Um, but there are a lot of ways a code that you're entering frequently can also be obtained if you're doing so uh, in public and on a regular basis. So uh, to the extent the fingerprint lets you choose a stronger code and you still need to enter the code whenever the phone shut down, I think that ends up being a, a, a security benefit. The other one that we hear a fair amount about is encrypted messaging apps. Right. So the libertarianism.org team, there's six of us and we are use instant message to talk instead of email because email's horrid. Um, and we use Telegram not just because it's the messaging app of choice for ISIS, um, but we like it. Uh, is, does is, that, that, is that their motto? <laughs> is that Telegram's uh, I don't, motto? I don't believe so. <laughs> okay. Um, but does that mean our communications are safe? Are these these apps a, a good way to go? I mean, again, it, it depends what your, what your threat model is. Um, if your threat model is, I think that I am specifically being targeted by a... Um, one of the more sophisticated state intelligence services, they're probably going to compromise the endpoint. That is to say, they're probably going to hack the end device, one of the end devices. So they've gotten um, to my computer. Right. At which point the encryption but in transit mean, doesn't matter. So that does that mean that they're probably – because we kind of talked about with Patrick Eddington some of this stuff, but that they're probably going to – I don't know, pretend to be the cleaning crew of Cato and put a USB in Aaron's computer. That, is that what you mean by hacking the end device? Well, and there are other ways that, that um, people can be hacked. I mean, they don't even need physical entry. Okay, so even they may know a vulnerability that is able to install a, a, a keylogger. That said, that's a pretty small percentage of, of people, certainly of, of U.S. citizens, at least in terms of um, U.S. Uh, compromise. If you're a business person who travels abroad, um, you you may well be a, a target of uh, you know China or, or, or Russian intelligence um, just for sort of economic espionage reasons. Um, so it's not a perfect solution. That is not to say don't do it. Um, it's absolutely worth doing because that's the extreme case. Um, you may have to do take other measures to uh, avoid that kind of worst case scenario for targeting. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to use. Uh, secure chat as, as as much as possible. Um, I, I personally use Signal, um, and uh, I'm hearing a lot of buzz recently about a 
uh, an app called Wired I just installed recently. The problem is it's so recent that not a lot of other people except for extreme security crypto nerds are on it yet. Um, but uh, those are both pretty good. Um, I think most of the security folks I know tend to prefer Signal to Telegram. Um, but there are, you know, there are various trade-offs involved. Signal is based on your phone number. So this is one of these sort of security anonymity trade-offs. Um, so it will secure the content of the communication. You do have to uh, give out to people who you want to communicate with you information about your phone number. Um, so it's not great as a sort of totally anonymous form of communication, whereas Wire, which is newer, um, operates on a username basis, so you can just give out your username. They're both end-to-end -end encrypted, meaning the company itself uh, does not have access to the contents of the messages, so they can't be turned over uh, either to a government, not just the U.S. government, but any government that, that tries to force them to hand over the contents of your messages. And I know Signal, at least, just doesn't keep much in the way of metadata uh, for, for very long anyway, meaning they don't even have a log of who uh, is communicating. Uh, one thing I will say is uh, uh, it is worth it to the extent that you're using this stuff, both for your own purposes and because it provides a kind of herd immunity, to make this stuff the default and not just uh, something you use for particular secure applications. I was talking to a friend who uh, is a journalist and was very proud about having just installed Signal finally. He said, well, now I finally I can have secure communications with sources. And I say, okay, so are you using this as your default for all your communications with your sources? And he says, well, no, I only, you know, I use it when I need to discuss something sensitive. And I say, well, then you're just wasting both of your time. Because um, if you're communicating with all of your sources regularly uh, through email, unencrypted email, and then suddenly you switch to Signal for one source and then you publish a story that has some, uh, you know, classified fact in it, uh, you know, it's not going to take a, a super genius to uh, figure out what, what's happened there. Um, the security comes from always using the secure technology, so nothing stands out uh, in a way that would uh, reveal something about, uh, about the activity, at least, you know, in the use case of a journalist where the fact of a different kind of communication would be enough to, let's say, lead a leak investigation to to the leaker. Um, so, and there's a more general herd effect, just because uh, you know a lot of governments look for encrypted traffic as a sign that you must be up to uh, no good. Of course, so if everyone's all, just using right. it all the time, now, all, look, all, like... all of us use encryption basically every day. If you have a modern smartphone, it is encrypted. If you ever connect to a site that you have to log into with a password, that part at least is encrypted. Um, in general, you're using encryption all the time because otherwise all of your traffic can be siphoned up and read by, by someone else. Um, it's just that it's usually not uh, visible to the user. The, the whole point is that it has to be so seamless enough that you don't have to be actively engaged beyond just confirming that, yes, the little lock icon is there and that uh, – or more often – uh, you know, if something's wrong, a not secure icon is there to tell you maybe you shouldn't input your password on this site. Uh, but to the extent that you are not unusual, either in terms of your own activity, uh, but also in terms of the general population for using uh, for using encryption, um, that makes it less useful as a sort of indicator of wrongdoing. What's uh, coming? I'm always scared to ask these questions for our tech policy friends who look at to see what sort of things are coming at both in terms of surveillance fears, new tech to keep our own privacy. Uh, is this going to become better? Uh, it's, you know, security better? We're going to be more secure in, in 10 years or is it, is it going to – I mean it's, it's very worse? hard to predict because we were in, in I think a, a, a constant sort of arms race uh, between – the, I guess the data gatherers, um, whether it's for marketing purposes, intelligence purposes, criminal purposes, and the people who want to try and uh, keep things secure. I think that the trend is definitely sort of in favor of the data gatherers because um, it's become a lot easier to keep communications secure, um, but it still takes a fair amount of effort. If you want to be really untraceable or invisible. There's a, a, a new book out by the, the former hacker Kevin Mitnick called I think, The Art of Invisibility. Um, and one of the things that jumps out is that if you really want to be um, 
robustly invisible, it takes a, a really dispiriting amount of effort. Um, and there are two sort of trends I think are worth watching in the future. The, the, the big one is what's sometimes called the Internet of Things, um, but more generally the fact that um, basically everything has a computer embedded in it now and sensor-enabled networked computing devices are now essentially ubiquitous. They are uh, in our cars. They're in our uh, kitchen appliances. They may be in our bodies if you have a pacemaker. Um, they're in sex toys now. Um, almost anything you can name um, has and increasingly will have a network computer in it and often a sensor in it. And this is going to be enormously convenient in a lot of ways, uh, some of which we detailed at the, at the beginning of the, the dialogue here. Uh, but, uh, but it does mean it's going to be a lot harder to uh, have that assurance of robust security because it's no longer enough to uh, encrypt your communications. You have to worry that your television might be able to hear the pattern of your keystrokes uh, from which you can very often... Uh, determine what's being typed because human beings um, have hands that are structured in a particular way. We don't type different letter combinations with equal speed. Um, and so – and this is a, a real sort of attack uh, that, that uh, been, we've seen people actually be able to use. Um, if you can hear the sound of those keystrokes and you know this is someone typing in English, um, you can very often reconstruct what is being typed from the pattern of, uh, of sounds. Um, when that becomes, uh, you know, a realistic attack vector, um, it's not just can I secure, securely encrypt this transmission, but, um, you know, am I aware of every sensor around me uh, when I'm using that device? And that's going to become increasingly impractical in a lot of ways, um, especially if you want to, for example, do something or send something connected to a network outside your home where it's less easy to associate with you individually. Um, the other thing that I, I lose sleep over is what is, I think, presaged by the Apple versus FBI fight. Um, that is the, the fight they had over the, the San Bernardino shooter's phone and whether Apple would help them crack the encryption on that. That was portrayed really as part of the, uh, the, the crypto wars. Uh, but in a more fundamental way, I saw that as the first salvo and maybe a new fight over government access to developer keys. Um, you know, we, we have these arguments about whether certain kinds of encrypted uh, software or communications platforms should be built with government backdoors. But basically any modern computer system, most modern computer systems used by most human beings have a kind of backdoor already. It's called the update system, um, right? To keep your phone and your laptop and your Alexa and your smart TV secure as new vulnerabilities are discovered, um, it needs to accept updates um, to add new features but also to uh, ensure that vulnerabilities are patched. And the way the devices regulate access, ensure that what they're getting is really an update and not a piece of spyware is – uh, there are cryptographic keys held by the developers used to authenticate that, yeah, this is really an app, an, a new update from Apple. This is really a new update from Microsoft. Um, and you saw in one of the legal briefs in the Apple FBI case a sort of footnote from the FBI saying, uh, well, look, if Apple didn't want to have to be forced to write code themselves to help us, you know, we would be willing to just have them hand over their encryption keys and we'll write the code. We thought Apple would not want to have to do that and, of course – uh, that was an understatement um, because they understand that that would be catastrophic for both security uh, and for the sort of the ecosystem of trust um, that software depends on. As soon as people recognize that keeping your software up to date um, may mean uh, installing spyware that some government has forced uh, the developer to turn over, uh, you have, uh, I think, a, an unsettling scenario where people become warier of uh, of installing updates, which creates other kinds of security problems. Um, and so, you know, sooner or later, I think some government, you know, if not ours, China, uh, is going to start trying to demand things like access to developer keys, which is to say the the backdoors to all these devices we're relying on. 
at which point we're, I think, going to have an interesting discussion about models for securing devices against that kind of attack, which is a, uh, which is a sort of hard one. Um, so one solution is um, if you are a very, very hardcore privacy person and um, nerdy enough to be willing to slog through using command lines for a lot of stuff, um, you might know about a, a very secure operating system called Tails. Uh, it stands for the amnesiac uh, incognito, uh, I forget what the L is for, system. Um, and the idea here is that this is an operating system that you keep installed on a USB key that basically is amnesiac. It starts afresh each time. Um, but it's also an, uh, an open source uh, product, which means that when a new version of Tails is published, it's posted online, the source code is posted online, and you can confirm that the new update version you're downloading manually is in fact the same as the widely published general release version um, that everyone can look at the source code of and confirm that it doesn't have any spyware in it. Um, that is secure against that kind of attack. You are manually downloading this stuff. You have a way of confirming that what you're downloading matches source code that's been publicly vetted. Um, but that's a lot less convenient than your phone has a new update. Are you ready to install it? Now, of course, Apple's trying to do a lot of this stuff behind the scenes about, you know, in terms of verifying um, the authenticity of the update. But by taking you out of the loop, you are in some sense required to trust Apple, required to trust Microsoft, required to trust Android um, about what you're getting. Um, so it remains the case uh, that uh, serious security and privacy protection um, are achievable, but often come at, at, at a significant cost in effort and usability. Um, the people I know who sort of spend the most uh, energy uh, uh, making sure that they have the capacity to retain, remain secure and anonymous online are also people who spend a lot more time thinking about that and worrying about it and learning how to use tools to do that than normal people want to. Um, so I think one of the, the promising trends we're seeing is that things like Signal and Wire and uh, other sorts of applications are trying to solve the problem of making it as possible for ordinary non-super geeks uh, to achieve levels of privacy that you n used to have to, you know, know how to compile your own kernel kind of stuff uh, to be able to, to practically use. Um, but we can see there are still a lot of places where there is that trade-off where um, if you don't want to have to roll your own, essentially, if you don't want to have to be willing to personally get involved in manually uh, confirming the security of something, that essentially means trusting some third party. Uh, and that is always the, the weak point in any, uh, in any sort of security situation. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.